as the users see on blogblog.com uh, from when you land on the site, from when you have to check out, is something that my team manages. Day to day task activities or tasks for my team are largely around uh, quick uh, features, lots of uh, data analytics. Um, it's a very mature product. Uh, Dr. has been around for over 10 years. And so a lot of we do, a lot of what we do and my team does is like my focus on the very specific part of the funnel uh, or, or the website and figure out how we can move things. So uh, again, I can have to answer questions after, but so what I do, I've been a PM for about five and a half years. Uh, just some companies I've worked at before, the author guys worked in India for a uh, startup called Plato, which uh, in some sense is the author of the village, it's like a series F and tech startup. Uh, I joined very early, I was at the PM, and I scaled to about 15 minutes on their team. Uh, also worked at a full tech startup, uh, also Marvel, and started my career in the second and I went to school and read the university of Minnesota and had undergraduate research and science and stuff. So, more interestingly, why am I talking about this? Uh, when I was called on to talk, I, I actually didn't know what to talk about. Uh, so many things you can talk about as a PM. Uh, but the person I was talking to asked me a simple question what you're passionate about. And so it was pretty easy uh, to figure that out. So, I've built products across four emerging markets. Uh, and I'm so passionate in doing so. So it's, uh, it's, I think it's a, a great opportunity for you guys to kind of understand how a lot of the markets are wired, how to think about them, and it's something I haven't spent so much time there. I grew up in India. Uh, I feel very passionate about it. In terms of a bunch of things, it was a huge opportunity. Uh, lots of people obviously that leads to uh, many, many different kinds of opportunities. Uh, very mind by problem statements. So the most interesting thing you do as a PM is you will fixate on the problem, uh, which means that it could be something as simple as improving the, you know, the rate at which people can offer, or introducing new product. So there's a like spectrum of problems, or how you do that. But that's like that's where you get the kick of product management is that you start to fixate or obsess about the problem. And and because it's such a big part of the world, with so many problems you always find. So I, I you know, feel very strongly about the kinds of problems that are on offer and I have to talk about that. And then again, it's difficult but rewarding. So anywhere in the developing world, in some sense, uh, you don't have the kind of infrastructure support. Um, the, the teams you work with are slightly less experienced, so the day-to-day -day is slightly harder. Uh, but the, the payoff of uh, doing that hard work is slow. So these are some of the things that make me excited uh, to talk about what I'm going to present today. And so just some preliminary, so I was trying to figure out how to sort of focus this session. There's, it's too big a topic to cover in one session. And so I've, the talk is largely focused on bringing an existing product to market. So if you are a PM in the US, which if you all will be at some point if you want, and you're tasked with either you know, launching a specific product in a, in a geography somewhere in the space, or figuring out whether you should enter the market, or what are the right launch strategy for for your company going into these markets. Uh, so it's it's from that viewpoint, there's a lot of different angles. There's a viewpoint of how do you find the right problem statement in a market like China or India or Philippines or Indonesia. That's much, much more complicated. And so I'm not going to focus on that. I can speak to that. But this is mostly helping you think through uh, uh, how to enter these markets. The primary focus, because uh, I'm working in India, the bulk of it is India, but I will talk about examples as I work. Uh, so this is for a general audience, uh, you, know, have some, you don't have to be a PM, you, you will never have to have visited it, so you, you can suffer for the lack of it. And I'll obviously cover some very high level examples of problems that I've worked on, uh, sort of odds and ends of uh, the markets, odds and ends of problems. Uh, but feel free to sort of ask questions, this is a primary submission, you will find a lot more uh, on pretty much everything I talk about, if you go online, uh, as I'm happy to find this. And finally, if you interact with, if you have a question, please interrupt me. Uh, it's probably easier to cover the questions as I go through uh, the, the talk instead of at the very end because uh, you lose context and lose context. So that's just some preliminaries. I kept the agenda very simple, it shouldn't be very long. Uh, I talk about what are emerging markets and interesting emerging markets as a term, uh, how do you sort of identify them. 
that focus on some of the key takeaways to be successful in these markets, uh, some including North and some that I focus on. Cool? All right. So, uh, this is the technical definition of an emerging market. You don't have to actually read it. It basically says a market that's really not a developed market, but it's on the path. Uh, and the, on the path is uh, defined in some very, very specific terms. And so, again, don't read through this. This is just for PSA. Uh, most of the, the definitions of what's an emerging market come from Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley has a fund that invests specifically in these markets. It basically talks about largely the type of companies uh, that exist in terms of their size, in terms of the maturity of the market, what's the, the financial markets like in these categories. And so some parameters to try and understand uh, how do you quantify. So they have basically three segments of markets in the world. There's frontier markets, so countries that are very strictly developing, uh, emerging, which is very much in the direction of possibly becoming developed, and then developed markets. So that's uh, like a very broad definition. There's of course very nuanced specifics, uh, and there are links here. Uh, kind of. So both. So these are the sum of countries that Morgan Stanley defines as emerging markets. So you can see the countries in the Americas, uh, Europe, and East Asia. Uh, the most famous set of emerging market countries are probably the BRICS countries. If you heard about it, Brazil, India, China, South Africa, uh, and Russia. Um, Again, as I mentioned, you, I've worked in I've worked in India with, with products called the Philippines and Indonesia, uh, which is kind of going to be the crux of uh, the, the talk. Any questions? So, why do the emerging markets matter? It, it, it's okay for me to come and say I'm passionate about it. It's okay for me to come and say that you know, Morgan Stanley says X, Y, Z. But they matter because it's a huge internet population, 1.5 billion internet users, pretty much as of today, uh, between just Brazil and China. If you are in Indonesia, uh, Philippines, Russia, the, the market ex exceeds more than people. So there's a lot of people who are who are using technology, uh, who have the potential to use technology, and who have the potential to be touched by technology. So which is very very exciting for anybody in, in the technology space, anybody in the product space. And then that's 40% of the world. So that's a big number in terms of just the amount of money going to the market. Right? Uh, this is the formal economy. This is a huge informal economy. So this is just what we want. Uh, there is, so again, this is all very well good, but it's high growth. These are markets that have internet users. These are markets that already have money flowing through them, and markets that are growing. Like India, for example, has been going at like eight, nine percent. China has been going at like nine, seven percent for the last two or three years, and so on with the other smaller markets. So there's a lot of growth there, and that's very exciting because for any business entering any of these geographies, you not only want to go into market that has a great audience, but also have the audience that's growing. And it's a young population. So, uh, in terms of demographics, India's median age is something like 29, Indonesia is 28, China is also some mid 20s. Compare that to countries in Europe, countries in Japan. Uh, so, it's a, it's a population that's very willing to, to new experiences. It's a population that's open to trying out new products, which is great for anybody in the technology space because all you need really is, uh, is the right audience uh, and the right strategy. And it's highly unexpected. So I mentioned that there are difficult problem statements. That's a function of just just not having enough services to support the needs of uh, of the economy, right? Uh, and this ranges the from the spectrum of, of healthcare to e-commerce to uh, edtech. Uh, you name it. There's all there's a business opportunity pretty much in every sector. Uh, and and so that that makes it really exciting. As if you take a step back and think about uh, your careers or your company. You're not only really thinking about, hey, I'm going and addressing a big, big audience. I'm, I'm addressing a big audience that really needs what I'm trying to do. If you've done your job right, uh, that's growing, and that potentially can make some money. So that's like uh, the trifecta of things you look at as you're thinking through: should I enter the market? Should I, what's the right product to enter the market? So uh, I mentioned four different things, uh, so four uh, sort of takeaways. The first one is the is, is pretty simple: is that the market needs to be right. Uh, and there's a bunch of there's a bunch of details that pop up, but it starts basically with just take your time to understand it. So early on, uh, when I was in here, I was in the US for a great time back to India. Around that time, 2012, 2011, 13 years, that two or three years spectrum, there's a lot of companies from the US who are thinking of moving to India, thinking of moving to China, 
and they had these very one size fits all product uh, and business philosophies. Which is that if something's worked in the US, it's just about adapting. There's a lot of homegrown companies that try to copy paste models, and very rarely does that work. If it works, it will get you some initial traction, but you really can't scale uh, and be a, a, a player to consider, be entrenched in, in the market unless you really take your time to understand each market. So there's some specifics that I'll cover in right? uh, Size of the market. So this is in product, uh, the product world. A lot of what you do will revolve around funnels, which is that you're trying to actually get down to what uh, it is that your feature is is doing, and then what what size of audience does it have. Right? So if you think about let's say Facebook, uh, Facebook has three billion users, two billion users, uh, but and Facebook newsfeed has a subset of the users. Messenger has a billion users, right? So if you're thinking about specific products like Facebook, for example, you really have to figure out if you're the product manager from a different region, right? How many people you want to get? Is basically where you start. Okay. Anything you do is either moving that number forward or or, or, or lower depending on what kind of product you're So it's really important to understand what is the size of the audience. This is like this is used very interchangeably in terms of like total addressable market, uh, market size, market opportunity. But it really says that more people doesn't equal more users. Right? There's a lot of nuance to understanding who are users. So spend that time to try and understand. Uh, a quick example of this is the fact that internet penetration uh, in countries is very big. So you should know that right on the top of your head if you think you're going to get insured or Philippines. Uh, second most important thing is size of your competition. Most of these countries have incumbents in most of the, the, the standard spaces. There's a health tech startup, there's a ed tech startup, there's a food tech startup. So the vanilla fields of, of, or you know, sectors that you imagine probably have an incumbent. Uh, which you should at the very least. Again, these are mental models to, for you to think of. It's a list with weights for each very dependent on your Okay, I mentioned this already. Understand internet mobile penetration and usage trend. Usage trend is again very, very important. I'll speak to that separately. But it's not enough for people to have a smartphone, right? It's, it's do, do people who have a smartphone use apps? Do people who have a smartphone spend more than 20 minutes a day, right? How much time do they have? Where do they use their smartphone? These are like these are very important things as you can think of, let's say, a lifestyle business versus a healthcare business, right? Versus a commerce business. So uh, take the time to try and understand some of these nuance. Uh, infrastructure support. So again, this is very, very underrated. Most people don't think about it, which is that if I go into the country, how easy is it for me to set up my subsidiary, right? Can I un can I understand the lay of the land there? So a very good example uh, is that in Brazil, for example. Uh, Infrastructure is is really really poor, and so if you're thinking of a logistics business, if you're thinking of e-commerce startup, you really have to actively think about what is the delivery time you can offer because the the delivery time outside of Rio and and Brasilia uh, and, and one more big city are really bad. You really can't get products in and out of the country because there's a huge lead time coming uh, from the ports of Brazil to the cities of Brazil. Okay, so. Uh, there's examples in the agri tech space, in the, in the food production space, where this is a real challenge uh, for not just uh, you know, Brazilian companies, but for companies who are looking to enter the market. So that's the nuance of Brazil. There might be different nuances of you know, different markets. For example, if you go to uh, Indonesia, the, the biggest ride share startup is called the company called Gojek. Uh, if you go to it, Gojek is a bike share startup. There's, you don't have taxis in Indonesia, you have bike taxis. So that's a that's a nuance of the market. That's a function of how crowded the car is, uh, and that's a function of how uh, people move from place to place. So and and again, that's a function of just uh, the, the population and the support services and offer. So take the time to try and understand some of that because Google influence uh, a bunch of things that you can set up your office and start launching. Again, this is another big question, uh, which is not just tech. Uh, but also product related, which is that if you're going in to uh, Indonesia, for example, you work there. Uh, if you're going to Indonesia, you probably have to support the half of this. Right? Uh, and to Brazil, you have to support the Now, it's very simple to say that so I, I use a translation service. A lot of companies outsource to a third party which translates everything. But when you think about what your technology teams have to do, you really have to now support two different languages. And right? that's called traditional overhead. So really, so if you're going to markets, let's say, 
prefer, preferably go for the English market if your product market is or if your business is not sorted, you don't have the kind of margins that are required to make it work in the English markets because localization is not easy. And the flip side of localization is if you go to a local language speaking audience within your product, you're not getting the same People are probably, unless you're serving a very, very critical need, the tolerance for uh, how good or bad your product works is very really dependent on the kind of need you're servicing. Possibly for in a healthcare space, calling a doctor in the middle of nowhere, it doesn't matter if you're not comfortable. But more than more than likely you are in a metro city with a lot of people, uh, with people who are smartphone or technology aware, then what would you cut use flag for not translating or not, not, not having large parts of the website translated or have now. So think of just the, the dynamics of the market in terms of uh, what, are, what is the type of audience you can reach and how and the cost it is. It, it incurs to you as a business. So consider population density. This is a very sort of minor point in the sense that if you're trying to build market places, if you're trying to let's say if uh, door dash tomorrow goes into China, right? Uh, then you have to think of what is the ecosystem of uh, restaurants that I, that I service. And on, on the other side, what's the ecosystem of consumers that I service? Is there enough critical mass if I onboard, let's say, 100 restaurants? Will I have enough consumers on the other side in a specific locality? Or will I just get two restaurants in a row? That is the notion of critical mass. So you always want to make sure that if you're running a market-based business, which is basically a lot of companies today, you really need to have the even of, of uh, completeness of supply, and so really think through some of these dynamics as you uh, as you even like, create a mental model for whether you should service the product. It's again very dependent on the type of business you're working. It will change from sector to sector, but it's something that you shouldn't take lightly simply because it's it's going to be success or failure on day one. Imagine opening up DoorDash and seeing one restaurant. No one's going to order. Doesn't matter how many consumers on the app, you need to make sure that your locality, which is where your audience is ordering from, um, gets enough choice. So, choice is very important, and that's a function of density on both sides. I'll cover after sales and onboarding slightly uh, like in a different part of this, but it's very important to think about B2B versus B2C. Are you a consumer business? Are you a you know, business? business? Uh, and in, in that context, how do you? Reach your customer, how you set your customers, and then how you support your customers. Right? That's again non trivial. It's very important to success to not just sell but also support and then bring in confidence. So, uh, again, I, I'll skip to this separately. The evolution of internet businesses. This is actually a very interesting use case from, from when I worked in India. So, I was working as the market based PM, uh, which is basically uh, if, if some of you read about Airbnb, Airbnb has a trust team, which is basically trying to figure out. Do consumers come in come to Airbnb and have enough faith in the system to book uh, without worrying about uh, you know, issues like refunds, uh, having uh, you know, having to think about what happens if there's a theft, what happens if uh, the place I'm living at is success, and many other such uh, challenges as you even uh, as you even think about whether I should be on Airbnb or booking. And on the flip side, if you're a host on Airbnb. You're thinking about what are the best in town, what are the places they have done, what are the steel in this town. So, uh, reliability or trust is a two sided problem in the marketplace. And the company is working in a track of either about three years into creating that marketplace for a couple of million users. And our approach to how to, how to do this was to just, uh, we said that we were responsible for you know, making a patient a doctor, uh, a lot of people to appoint it's locked off. Uh, but we realized that the, the economy or the, the, the space around us had started to evolve so quickly that people were used to the Ubers, the, the Amazons of the world. But when you go into Uber, Uber is very, very particular about the experience you're having. Right? Uber cares about was the cab right good, was the cab dirty, was the cab not feeling when you beat the driver on time, and you know, many other such metrics. And the flip side, the driver cares about cancellation rates and so on and so forth. So because the adoption for Know, companies like Uber or platforms like Uber was so high, not just Uber but many parallel in different sectors. It sort of forced our hand to, to give or to conform to a much higher level of service. Uh, and so we had to own the problem of reliability. We had to figure out that before before you if a consumer books an appointment with a doctor, how do we make sure that the consumer actually meets the doctor? How do you make sure that the doctor is able to get in touch with the, the, the patient if something goes wrong? Right? 
it's something that we hadn't thought about, but because everybody was providing such a, providing such a high level of service, it, it forced us to think about it because we would not have been able to survive in a space where consumers are, are expecting so much out. So this is again very important, which is that just what are the kinds of services uh, and businesses in the market and what is the quality of service that's offered. At the very least, you need to be at the uh, quality of service. If you're below your your ideas, and anybody can come and offer better service. So that's really important as well. Uh, the last two are you know, pretty, the regulation is pretty standard. Uh, just to give you an, an example with the whole Facebook uh, controversy and all the, the challenges around data and security, a lot of countries are pushing for Facebook and apps like Facebook to have uh, the data, to have their data saved locally in the country. So that changes the same thing with Amazon. That changes a lot for uh, for companies like Facebook, they're of course fighting it. But the challenge is now you need to have a data center in a place like India, whereas your data center strategy was completely different. You didn't even think about needing a data center. You didn't even think about needing to have data locally saved in India. You probably have it somewhere in you know, Sweden or somewhere in the US. So uh, think through what are the nuances, think through what are the laws uh, of, of the country you are in and what are the, the NDI, one of the most common things that you face as you go into a lot of these emerging markets, you have very protectionist companies that have strong rules against foreign direct investment. So if you're looking for a partner tomorrow, if you, if you want your Indian or Chinese or Chinese investors or like Indonesian subsidiary to raise money, uh, the amount of money that can come in internally and externally is a cap already, as defined by the government. So be aware of these things. And finally, quirks of the market and exploit them. We'll have an example from India. India had this weird culture of, of uh, people miscalling each other. So if you because call rates were very high, people actually didn't people actually didn't pick up. They, they called each other and they texted, or that was like a that was a proxy for I want to get in touch with you. A lot of companies then pivoted. Uh, there's, a, there's a company that actually made uh, a few million, three hundred millions, yeah, that dollar business called Zipdial, which Twitter acquired in 2015. The entire value prop for the company was how do we help people communicate with each other through, through uh, misquotes. So businesses would get in touch with people, uh, give a number to, to you know to miss call, uh, that would hit an API and response would be difficult and you get a call back because people just didn't want to call. But that was so deeply ingrained in the psyche that uh, you just you if you had changed that message to call this number, your response rate would have been significant. So understand and this is a, this is a book of India someone happened in the US uh, you know, you can call any time, maybe people want to text. So there are little odds and ends of the market uh, that are very important to understand. The best way to do this is just try and meet as many locals as possible, meet businesses. Uh, so this is, uh, this is probably the most important takeaway is build for mobile. Right? Uh, in a lot of places, I love to use memes uh, or end gifts, but I think uh, in the interest of time, we just have one. So. <laughs> Uh, it's really true, a lot of people just don't know what desktop was. Uh, we completely skipped uh, desktop in India for, for the last generation. You skip desktop in, in uh, Philippines, businesses just don't have uh, desktops anymore. People are operating on smartphones. My first product was launching a tablet for a product we originally launched uh, as a SaaS solution for hospitals. And the reason we had to do that was because uh, we, just, we just couldn't get to enough uh, clinics or and hospitals who had established setups. If they had a desktop, they didn't have an internet connection. Uh, if they had an internet connection, they a phone. So what's, what's the best way to do this? So we got a tablet, we built a tablet, uh, and then you know, put in the software on that, figure out what the right value for, and then you know, work through the market. So uh, for consumers especially, if you're thinking of consumer businesses, uh, please don't think desktop. That's the last, probably last thing you're thinking of. For business, uh, B2B startups, desktops are still of course important. But a lot of the high touch points or the high frequency of you know uh, use cases are primarily done on mobile. Right? Uh, Google Calendar, for example, is so predominant if you're in some way open to you know set up a sales call with someone. People are so intuitively you know hooked on to checking calendars. You're probably not better off sending them an SMS. You're probably better off sending them a calendar. Google Calendar. So. So this is probably not news to anyone. Smartphone usage has been going rapidly. China is uh, at about 750 mobile internet users. This is from the main report this year. Last year, uh, unsurprising, it continues to grow. You see, curve going to the right. 
uh, and the same thing as Intel, couldn't find a similar graph, but it's 650 internet, a million internet users of which the majority are not right? This is true pretty much of every country in the region, uh, also true of Brazil. So keep in mind that mobile is probably the form factor you're solving the problem on. Uh, and uh, when I started product management in 2013, uh, 2014 actually, a lot of what I did was was not thought of as mobile for uh, you know, give a simple example, when you went to a designer to think of a feature, the first thing you did was mock it up on test and then figure out, okay, how would we now mock up this specific thing on, on a mobile phone or a mobile form factor has completely changed. We have mobile only uh, you know, solutions, mobile only apps, and that's reflected by just crazy growth in, uh, in mobile management, right? So uh, keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that these markets are pretty much just Android, right? Uh, you know, India is 90%, Brazil is 80%. Uh, the most, uh, I mean, 26% iOS share in China is pretty good number. But still, as a, as a fraction of the market, you're still Android first. Uh, in, in a lot of geographies, if you think about uh, specific metro areas, it's absolutely predominant here, right? So uh, don't underestimate, or don't think that your iOS app, which is working great in, in the US and Europe, is, is going to work one for one. There's, there's ways to do this. You can build you know, HTML5 apps, you can build a spin up a quick Android app, but just make sure that if you have an app only strategy, uh, you are aware that it's an Android market. And of course, this is largely aided by extremely cheap data. India has uh, insanely cheap data. A lot of other countries relative to the US also have very cheap data. Uh, China is much cheaper, uh, Indonesia, Philippines couldn't find it on the graph, but again, still cheaper than other Singapore. So internet penetration is, is not only good, it's also backed by cheaper data packets, which means that you can actually use online services for and then again, China does everything in a crazy rate. So, mobile data usage in China is now in the exabytes and can absolutely do it. So, uh, very encouraging if you're trying to think about launching or, or figuring out whether you should enter the market and do you have an audience for it. If you have an audience, you have an audience that's mobile, you have an audience that uses data, that's pretty much part of the post in terms of what you expect going into the market. So this is something very interesting, which is, and it's also true over here. Uh, we see that a lot at Softop as well. Mobile is not equal; it's not the same. As the so this is a quick graphic, uh, just from India, which says what is the the unique visitors on the top 100 apps, which is the top 500 mobile websites. Uh, you can see it's it's double, it's more than double the number that you get on the apps. And so mobile web or the browser on the phone remains a key acquisition channel, especially for the businesses. So you're, you're, and if you think about just product management in general, downloading an app has three or four steps to it. First, identify by the value proposition for the app, and I'm just going to go and download the app. So you have to click into that, go to the Play Store, download it, open it up, maybe get an account and your phone number, accept a notification message. There's so many steps to experiencing the product. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have used OfferUp uh, as like a Craigslist competitor. OfferUp. Key value proposition to a large degree is, is the fact that when you open it up, it doesn't look great, but it's giving you like this. The first thing you see is a feed of things offer up sells. So the, the friction that, that the user has to experiencing offer up value proposition is so low because you are right there. You start it. So make sure that, and that's what mobile web offers. You go to a URL, it's already in the So use that as an acquisition strategy. Apps again depends on frequency of use case. If you're a product that's going to be used once in eight months, Maybe you have some loyal users in the app, but it's not your, your top uh, or even the top two apps. Right? Uh, so think about invest whether or not you should invest in having an app. Right? For example, this is relevant compared, you know, given that the last slide I said it's an Android market. It doesn't matter if you're on the browser. It doesn't matter. It's Android, iOS, Chrome, Moose, Safari. There are a few differences, uh, but fundamentally you're build, building a, a web experience. So uh, whether or not you even need an Android app is really dependent on the kind of business you're trying to drive, the frequency at which you're trying to drive engagement, um, and whether it makes sense for you uh, given the, the value proposition of it. Right? So if you're a chat app, for sure, you can even have an app that you need on the website. Uh, but if you're an app that you know, allows shopping every so often, a great example of this is uh, you know, Twitter Lite. Twitter created a Lite version of its product. 
for uh, Philippine Union, Indonesia, Southeast Asia primarily. Um, you know, and, and the primary goal here was to allow people to use Twitter on the browser uh, in a manner which allows people to work quicker, which reduces the, the amount of data that we would use. Um, the same thing with uh, Facebook, which is a light version, so does, you know, so do plenty, plenty of e-commerce companies in India. So, uh, again, don't just assume that mobile is, is, is directly related to app, it's probably not. Uh, but the, the degree to which it is, is really dependent on the space you're okay. So, I said all good things about mobile, but there are plenty of challenges. Just giving an example from India. Uh, even though data is cheap, coverage is poor. Uh, one of the biggest things I had to deal with working in India was patchy internet coverage. Uh, and the result of which, practically speaking, translates to your product having to su support an offline mode. Right? I don't, in the US, I don't think about people being offline very much, people losing con connectivity, maybe in the subway in New York, but maybe you cover very quickly. Over here, there's long periods of, of not being online. That can affect a whole bunch of things. Right. Uh, in terms of if you're a website that has is in the payment space, right? Uh, how do you make sure that a transaction that's stuck because someone lost connectivity suddenly goes through? Right? How long do you keep that transaction? How long do you hold inventory till someone comes back online? These are problems you really have to think of. One of the things I had to spend a lot of time doing is to figure out um, what's the right architecture for my team to think about syncs. So, to, to, so we had a we had a common. Um, product across multiple platforms, but the experience today that users expect is you go from web to app to desktop, you're basically back where you left off. But that back where you left off experience is really dependent on my ability to save the user's last known state. Right? Uh, so it sounds, it's not, it probably doesn't sound it is extremely complicated to implement, but it's a reality that we had to work with because the expectation was, I open my app, I'm you know, pretty much picking up from where I left off, I'm logging to my account, you guys know what I did last. So these are some of the, the considerations as you move things through the market as a whole, and it changes again. It swings widely. If you go into uh, you know, smaller towns, um, which sometimes you might have to for a you know, logistics startup or if you're an e-commerce startup, you don't just want to be in the metros uh, or, or the, the big metro areas. You really should think about what is the internet coverage. Right? So that 500 billion internet uh, user number is extremely misleading because of those 500, you probably reliably have 15 million. 100 million tops who uh, in India who basically have uh, internet connectivity day in day. So you can reliably uh, you know, and confidently say that if I send a push notification, this guy will get pushed. Because for the rest of them, there's, so many, there's long periods of connectivity disconnect, disconnection uh, that you have to consider that uh, in anything. And it's again, uh, to speak to one more example, if you're running a marketing campaign, you might do that. Uh, you're really basing all your estimates of how many people you have reached. And th there's one thing to you know send a notification to whatever engine you use, but it's the further notification to get delivered, you really need you know, you need access to it. So keep that in mind. Internet speeds are inconsistent and uh, product I already mentioned offline, but very, very interesting uh, set of product. Google has this fantastic initiative called the, the next billion users. Uh, so I advise you guys to check it out. It, it, Google builds a bunch of products for different use cases, uh, largely centered on serving new users who they wouldn't ordinarily get. So this this is you know everything from translation to providing more internet access to in the case of YouTube coming up with an offline mode. So they realized people have patchy internet connectivity. So when people were online, people went and saved or downloaded videos, uh, which wasn't available in the US. It wasn't even required because people were streaming. Um, but it's a it's a feature that's become extremely popular. It's actually been spun it off into on app, um, and so you might have to do these product innovations as you think through, uh, you know, whether or not I'm going to be successful in the market. What what does it take? Again, all of these are things that you should probably think of to some level before you you, know, you should be aware of some of these things. And then finally, I already mentioned Facebook and Flipkart. Storage constraints are constraints are real. A lot of people. Uh, very surprisingly, another example from India, WhatsApp faced a huge problem in India because they realized people were exchanging good morning messages. So, you might have read about this. People were sending good morning messages with images, inspirational quotes, which is fine, it's really good to get a you know, message every so often, mm -hmm. but, uh, but people like it. People were sending messages every day. The challenge was it was choking up the phone's uh, storage. So, people were unwilling to install apps. 
Um, and that basically spun off this whole you know, sort of butterfly effect like reaction where a lot of other apps suffered because WhatsApp was just choking up every user's phone. WhatsApp, of course, sought for it uh, in, in, uh, by reducing the number of people you can forward a message to and so on and so forth. But to think really about uh, smartphones. Uh, what, what is a smartphone like? There's a huge spectrum in these markets of smartphones that are available. Google actually launched uh, a flavor of Android just for very simple and level smartphones with the same principle. You don't want the OS to be very heavy uh, and to take away from the app experience that that can be able to So uh, that's this part of the section done. And just to kind of uh, give you some in some sense. So this is from today, particularly some kind of news. And I found this this news headline. So Netflix is testing a mobile only subscription uh, at basically half the price of its uh, regular subscription. Um, mostly given given by the fact that people are just not downloading apps uh, to the extent that Netflix would expect given the price point. And it's really a cost benefit. If Netflix uh, charges much lower than it does in the US, but it's still a high, higher number than uh, people are talking about. So the low cross band mobile only simply because people are using just that form factor. And so companies are adapting to some of the challenges they are facing. Uh, third very important thing is really is the plan for market. Right? The big learning for me working in, in all of these markets is that making money is very, very hard. Uh, it's hard in general, but it's really hard as a business, an internet business or an internet startup in almost all of these markets. Uh, maybe with China being this like uh, So I just put I put down some numbers here. Uh, I already mentioned that markets are hard to monetize. These are some of the biggest startups in their own space in India or Southeast Asia. So Zomato is a huge food tech startup, like 30 countries, KTM is India's largest uh, digital wallet. Uh, and Online bank provider. It has 300 million, 200 million accounts. Uh, Flipkart is, is a company that Walmart recently acquired uh, for 17 billion. Uh, it's, it's the biggest e commerce company in the country. So, Grab is uh, Asia's largest e right startup that uh, basically acquired Uber Southeast Asia. So, uh, just look at the revenue numbers. Zomato is at 74 million, they have a per day of about 11 million. Paytm has 480 million their, their losses. Uh, after tax are uh, half of this, they lose two hundred million dollars roughly on on the base of two hundred million, right? Uh, Flipkart is three billion. Just to give some context, I got, I got some numbers. So Lando, I don't know if you've heard of the Lando, Germany's biggest e-commerce startup, made uh, six point one billion stock. Right? Now that's massive. That still is a much much smaller market, but just the amount of money that we Etsy, uh, Etsy has office right there in Brooklyn. Etsy is so small, most of food because we never use Etsy. Etsy made 600 million uh, last year, 604 uh, in 2018. And you're comparing this to, a, to companies that have in the in the order of at least 100 million. Dollars. All of these companies are at least 100 million. That's I mean. So this is massive scale, but you're struggling for this. And a lot of these companies are pitted against some competitor, competitor or the other. So it's about either a two way, three way, four way race, mostly four or three. Uh, of one VC investment versus another VC investment, and a uh, land grab in terms of trying to get customers. So, which is really good, but as a new business or as a as a product lead or a growth lead for the market, you're really thinking of hey, go and come and how can I make money uh, off of my user base in a market where you get a spoiling. Like in India, it's, it's so bad that you can probably get a eight ten dollar meal for it up because it's, there's so many discounts and, and so many. It's all venture funded, but it's the ecosystem in the world. So just be aware of that. And then just as a side note, right? I mentioned India has 500 million users. It only has 50 million monetizing users for company purposes, of which 10 million, 10 million are realistically uh, the set of users who actually make any money. Right? So it's a country with a 1.3 billion plus population, with roughly 500 million users, of which only 10 million. That's your fund. A huge population of which realistically if you are entering the country today, you can't be thinking beyond 50 million. There are startups with 100 million dollar in VC funding who are just not able to push the envelope on who they can monetize. So be aware of that from day one because 
the the big grouping user. So just to give you a sense of how much you get charged, Spotify charges between thirteen dollars a month in the US. So one point six seven they just entered India. Netflix now charges half based on what I just showed you. Amazon is insane. Again, twelve thirteen dollars, about two dollars a month here. So the the premise behind why you're in these markets needs to be very very clear. Uh, most of these guys are in for growth, so they're willing to subsidize the cost of subscription. Uh, they have huge modes in the form of either revenues or money, uh, and in a long term view of the strategy they're taking as they went to the market. Netflix has original content, Spotify has a ton of again original content and partnerships, Amazon Prime also. So don't oversimplify uh, what it takes to make money. It, it is a challenging problem, and it's something that you should probably know at the outset, right? So some guidelines to how you would monetize is first get a scalable business plan. Right? Just make sure that make sure that you don't have a business plan that is just focused on getting you know, the first million dollars. Right? It's easy to pay. In the markets that you that you know that, that these countries are like to get a million dollars, it's very hard. It's really difficult to make money in India, so work really hard on this business plan and focus on who you're going to monetize. Are you do you monetize consumers? You know, really think about it because um, think of companies with you know billion dollar watches subsidizing pretty much everything. And you walk in, they say, "No, hey, that's all. Who picks up? Charging two dollars for for order. So the company just takes two bills. Two bills are free. Two bills charges about four dollars for an order in New York, in your neighborhood. You would probably get a whole meal for four dollars in India, including your your delivery, the cost of it. So." Also, a missing fact where it's uh, had to sell their India business or in the, in, the, uh, in the pipeline of, of in the process of selling the India business to its the biggest competitor. So we have to avoid dollars. See, because the challenges of making money from consumers are very, very real. Uber's already making money on the driver front. They probably can't afford to do it on another front. So really think about uh, who the audience are monetizing. We do know businesses are much easier to monetize, but also much harder to scale. So, which are the so who is your competitor? So I mentioned which is like who are you comparing to? If you're a consumer business in a in a space like uh, in a country like China, for example, Alibaba is uh, insanely popular, uh, very very affordable. Alibaba is like a go-to uh, you know model for how you put uh, how you pay with your payments business. You know, going if you are uh, if you are relying on let's say WeChat's platform to pay the service, which has an ecosystem around itself. When you're really thinking about each app is going to 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 large degree to take how much on your so you really have to be conscious of where you're operating, how much you can charge, given who the big players are. Okay, and you can't be you can't go and set your price point. A lot of this is about pricing, uh, but but the, the big takeaway is that it's about the business model, it's about who you charge and what form, what shape, uh, and at what stage does your business become uh, inevitable. So, uh, a standard uh, you know, B2B or even you know, B2C startup uh, you know, business, uh, business plan in some sense or a, a business model is to charge, not charge consumers but charge suppliers. So you, you try and uh, you know, aggregate suppliers, it's what a lot of marketplaces do and you charge commissions off of them. Again, this is really easy, this sounds really easy especially if you're servicing a need, let's say you're doing medicine with the like, you know. You go to a small city, you have to get all the pharmacies, you talk about giving them a the business, um, you charge them to Sounds really fair. But can you scale that uh, as you go to bigger cities? Can you move to 10%, to 15%? You probably, you probably might be able to, but you struggle to scale. So think about you know, where the commissions will scale. Uh, but on the flip side, a lot of people are trying subscription businesses, right? From, uh, from Companies that uh, focus on content, to companies that have media, media to new media houses, uh, to uh, you know, food tech startups, to Amazon like uh, you know, Prime subscriptions. Uh, that's one of the things that consumers have uh, pretty much across the market. Largely to Amazon, we do a lot of e-commerce companies. Uh, that's a mental model people are now a lot more comfortable. That is from MC. 
which is that they are willing to pay something <coughs> for a service that continues to give them benefit, not that much. Right? So it could be subsidized food, um, subsidized delivery uh, fees. But, but this again, the caveat is only works for high frequency services. If you are a service that people are going to once a month, um, let's say in your uh, a Sam's Club like service, uh, people are not going to Sam's Club every day. Very unlikely that people are paying uh, money for a subscription in a market like India or in Asia. So be aware of that as you think through how you're going to scale your business. Uh, and of course, all this boils down to intuitive economics, which is pretty much what we And then I mentioned this in passing, but just look, so this is again, this is driven by what your goals for entering the market. Like, why are you going to Southeast Asia? Why are you going to India? Why are you going to China? Why are you going to Brazil? There's, there's definitely a business goal. Most likely, it's a user growth. To make sure that you understand if it's user growth, how much value will you have to the business and profit? And how much, what is your more? Uh, test acquisition strategy. So, consumer acquisition uh, is is non trivial. Um, it is a playbook for consumer acquisition across the world. People use Facebook, people use SEM for online channels, offline uh, advertising. The, the efficacy of these solutions will by the by profit. You'll find in a lot of places offline advertising is not particularly popular, which is going to get the advertising that you expect. Right? And Facebook ads are quite expensive. Uh, figure out your distribution channels. If you are any kind of supplies within a company, you need to have a good network of distributors across the country to be able to deliver a level of service. Again, goes back to people in different countries expect different levels of service. That's dependent on how good your distribution channel is. Can you get goods to people in time uh, and how you look happy? So making those relationships happen through important and then there are partnerships, can you, you know, go back your way to uh, you know, any kind of growth or like quick growth based on part of people who have common interest. And finally, this is again probably something I can't emphasize more, is that it's very difficult to change the price point in any of these markets once you're there. If you're charging, let's say, $2, and Netflix is charging, for example, uh, $7 for their standard subscription, it is going to be very, very hard for Netflix to change that $7 to $12, right? the US subscription. Like if you go to $8, go up by a dollar, so the best thing I've seen work in a lot of people is use, use pricing here. Netflix does that really well. They have a baseline subscription, now you see something even cheaper. They have you know a gold, silver, or beige kind. It's a very SaaS or B2B uh, mode of thinking, which is that you have different levels of service, different types of product based on who your audience is and what they're willing to pay. So that's a good strategy going in because uh, once you set a price point, the market normalizes around it, no one's willing to buy. Is going to be resistant. And I mentioned tech over here is because <coughs> it's a very, again, as a PM, it's a very non trivial problem statement. You have to support a ton of players. Think of you launching a business on day one, the business charges like $50. Right? You realize two years later, you need to scale up, you're going to go to $6. Some of your customers from very early on are going to refuse to move. You've built up enough for base of customers that you can't afford that much. So now you need to support $4 and $6. And two years later, you probably move to let's say eight dollars. If you're still supporting six dollars, maybe you make your first set of users go to go to uh, four to six. But then this thing get complicated pretty quickly, depending on your audience size. And so now you have to support different price plans, different your account manager sales team now team differently based on different tiers of customers. So start that at the outset so it's simple, uh, if possible, if this, I'm always simplifying. But this is this is a strategy I've seen work. It's a strategy you should implement. Um, again, a couple of companies to check out who produce things really well. China has, again, some of the best and most profitable uh, early stage to, to, to growth state startups that I've seen. Um, there's, there's a company called Guapo, uh, which, is in, which is like a online telemedicine, which is Teladoc, uh, online healthcare. So, they have, for a lot of that part of the world, these companies are essentially creating the playbook about how to do products and how to market products. So if you really want to think through the Chinese customer, the Chinese, the Chinese audience uh, is far more willing to pay than most of the other countries in, in this entire cohort of, of, uh, of markets. So that's a good example for anybody who's trying to figure out hey, how to make money in an internet business. WeChat, Huawei, uh, Zonian, which is an insurance company, 
company or partner had. They, they all somehow figured out a way that it works. Uh, so, of course, you can't repeat it, but it seems to have ideas and that's what I would do. If I have to get And finally, you know, almost at the end of this, you have to level up capital. There's got to be some fund having billions of people. Uh, and there's got to be some, there's, there has to be some change, uh, or there's a potential for some change in your thought process as you work in economies where labor is cheap. So, so, to give some numbers, the cost of hiring an entry level sales or ops associate is pretty much as low as over 500 dollars. In the US, it's, uh, it's, in, it's probably 8 times, 6 times. So, you can easily hire people. There's a little bit of a cost associated with paying these people, but the demographic dividend is in, on your side because these people who are available for cheap, they're educated, and they are so living. So that's something that you can totally leverage. Uh, and so this is very important, which is that if you are, again, let's say you're, again, like I mentioned at the beginning, this talk is really centered on most of you guys being product managers, they are looking to move, to move your respective businesses into some of these markets. When you go into a market, you should have a startup strategy. How am I going to get to my first 10,000, 1 million users in a way that is consistent with the business goals? A lot of it doesn't have to be focused on those engineering. Let's assume that you are a startup and uh, that needs to acquire businesses. You are your a B2B ish startup or a B2B2C B2 startup, for example. Your starter strategy could involve a few months being model. You have, let's say, 10, you know, 10 20, 30 salespeople per city or looking and talking to every person, um, every client, um, four, four, five times a day. On an average, you know, the, the stat is. In a lot of uh, businesses in India, consumer driven businesses, it's about three to four meetings to close the, the lead per team. And companies are very comfortable in starting off by employing capital uh, because they're unsure of whether they should invest on the technology side. So you don't, don't over invest in, let's say, an engagement module or a training or a onboarding uh, module if you have people who can do the job because you're simply so unsure about whether the business is going to work or not. Okay. Which brings me to the next point, which is that. Plan to migrate or grow uh, once you have achieved your product market fit. So only, and this is again some rule uh, of creating MVPs, which is, I think product school is covered in some of the talks, is that when you build an MVP, try to keep it as low fi. Uh, your fidelity level needs to be absolutely you know low. And part of this is if there's people who do the job in a non-temporary, but in a temporary fashion, use them. Right? Think about scaling once you have to really think about scaling. Uh, another sort of a live example that we faced was that uh, we were setting up a marketplace for people to decide uh, which doctor they wanted to visit. And, and a big part of that is really having all this information about doctors, which in a country like India or Indonesia is really not easy. You can't go somewhere and buy. There is no medical association. There's like 30 different associations with all different kinds of data. Um, we had a big part challenge one how do we go and get this data? Right? Same thing with restaurants. You know, in Zomato, you had to go and collect data from restaurants. You know, basically piecemeal by piece. You had to go to each place, go and take a photo, take a photo of the menu. But it was possible initially because you could hire people. Right. Uh, so definitely don't over engineer. We had to do. I did an entire project around verifying whether someone was a legitimate doctor or not. There was a, there was a widespread problem in, in India of quacks of fake doctors. And the way to do that was to verify whether they had a medical license. But the, the smart solution was to just send people, uh, collect a lot of the medical licenses and verify them against the database we had. The over-engineered part would be looking to first get all of those numbers from different associations and then map them to the data <coughs> system. Which is much, much, much slower. We can this in like two days. The text is in the data is two days. So, um, you know, you can take some shortcuts, um, which is true for all products, but over here you can take shortcuts by hiring people and getting people really quickly, get them, spilling them out into efficient resources, which is much, much harder to do. I think so, you have to think 2-3-4 times over in the US uh, before you, you know, hire a single person. Because the cost is not just the cost of the salary, it's the cost of the insurance, it's the cost of support, you know, uh, benefits, and so on and so on. A lot of that does exist, but it's again the costs are much much lower. And again, B two B two C businesses, which is basically let's say you're starting a logistics company, you want to you want to supply 
uh, a company like Boxed in New York, which basically helps businesses buy things in bulk, uh, is in theory very simple or much simpler to do in all of these markets simply because you have the, the ability to create this network across the country um, by virtue of having people available to do the job. You're not relying on uh, you know, APIs, you're not, not relying on a middle layer that plugs into another middle layer from where you can do all of this sort of information. So your auto book can be a person, your auto book could be a call center, uh, won't scale, but will give you a quick proof of concept. So if you're an e-commerce company, very standard reason that you're against saying e-commerce company realizes costs of moving are too high, uh, has to build its own logistics arm, starts off very well. They don't really they don't really invest, they don't have an inventory management system, they buy that, or they you know have people like that. So uh, think small, leverage people uh, because it's a good starter strategy, don't rely on it. Any questions? And think uh, okay. So quick end notes. Uh, again, I mentioned this before. The emerging markets have tremendous potential uh, in terms of just the number of people, the opportunity to grow, uh, and the opportunity to actually make money. It's a good thing that people haven't figured out how to make money easily because it gives everybody the opportunity to work. Right? If it was a developed country uh, with a very stable set of businesses, that means that the opportunity is much higher, or uh, is much lower. So the cost to entry is maybe a little high given all of the variables that we talked about, but the upside for any business is significantly higher. Uh, just to sort of quickly go over some of the things we discussed, uh, the four principles are just kind of understand the market. That's probably the most important thing. Uh, is understand who you're trying to solve the problem for and what are the ground realities of the space you're going to operate in. Build on mobile. Uh, and figure out how you monetize. Totally, I've seen actually more companies through this. They get their users with a year or two later, they're actually like problem solving how to make money. And that essentially means pivots. So there's a startup that did, uh, that did delivery, food delivery, uh, which realized that it just couldn't make money in a space where there were so many food delivery pillars, uh, grocery deliveries, right? something like an Instagram, meaning yeah, Instagram or Amazon Flash. And they actually pivoted now to becoming an agri tech business. And this is like sort of a Pivoted to being a uh, a back end box like business for businesses, and they pivoted to helping farmers, and now they're like for So the that's a painful process. If you can probably preempt a lot of that by thinking it through, it's not going to succeed, but you should have some thoughts on it, and you should start testing it out in the market. And uh, leverage human capital. There's people available. They're skilled. Uh, the percentage of university graduates is surprisingly high, uh, and in absolute terms, you will not have a problem. Anymore. So make sure that if you have a problem which you can show people that, you can totally And then finally I mentioned I'm excited about the market, that's not really vague. Some of the sectors that I'm excited about in general uh, are sustainability solutions. The, the, the problem with a lot of these countries is uh, India probably at the center of it, China is doing much better job, but uh, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, Philippines, uh, other countries in the Middle East is urban additions. It's un uh, plan city building, which has a ton of, of, of problem from you know the challenges of you know, bad air to, uh, to garbage to water pollution problems to just basic infrastructure issues. So you have a bunch of problems to to, to address going into the metro areas, uh, and that's a huge opportunity because more than we do. So sustainability solutions. This is just an example of supply chains. Supply chains are not thought of as being as having to be energy efficient. You don't really you make money when a business goes green. That's that's a proven uh, fact, which none of these markets are really it's not about the game. So if you're thinking about it, it's definitely a huge area of opportunity. Because think of it's it's essentially uh, the the fast food and, and uh, hospital but like there are the fast food chains make people unhealthy and the hospitals. So uh, it's a, well, as we discovered today, we were looking at uh, putting a map on our pages, and Google has uh, has these plots. They have uh, people who spoof. They have uh, software that spoofs these people to try and figure out if the website is performing. So they have to figure out whom to rank where. And we are very, very worried about the fact that the bots or the, the robots Google sends to a website. 
uh, actually qualifies as a as a, name or a user, uh, as a legitimate user for the Maps API that Google of, Google charges for us. So I, I don't think that's the case, but but it's a it's a good example to make sure that you have a bunch of people who are thinking extremely in an extremely capitalist way, uh, exploiting the market economy. Um, that also on the flip side pays the opportunity for services that are solving for what they are doing. Um, NBFC lending, so I didn't talk about specific sectors, but, but finance as a sector is huge. Uh, the ability for small businesses or, or individuals to get loans uh, is, is highly underexploited. Banks actually don't reach large parts of these countries. Liberal banks are extremely effective. So that remains an opportunity just because the reach is just not very high. And then micro mobility. This is something you see in the, in the US as well with, uh, with city bike or with, uh, with Lyft, uh, with school. And that's a trend that that Project kind of pioneered in the Philippines. But that's something that we're seeing across the board. Uh, that's uh, pretty much it. I thank Jack. So, thank you.